The Mandalorian has a composer. Darth Vader has a dad. George Lucas, still rich. Jedi Council <laughs> starts now. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> hey -oh. We love creating our own B-roll here. Cody's great at that. Just sees me just... Uh, uh. Welcome to Collider Jedi Council. Uh, for December 20th, we're live today. This is the last live show of 2018. Next week, a nice pre-taped question and answer episode with me, Christian, and Darina. But today, I am joined by two favorites. I love when these two are on the show. We get to really mm -hmm. dive into some stuff. It is the Grand Moff Nemiroff. Perry Nemiroff. I am so happy to be here. I feel so... Star Wars spoiled this week between oh, being yeah. on this show and also uh, Mark and Mark invited me on Rule of Two and it was just uh, <laughs> to be the Rule of Three. It was <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of the comments there, but it was uh, it was nice to dig deep into all that stuff and we got a pretty cool lineup here. So yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah not we a bad got, way to end the year. We got some stuff to dive into and putting it together. He produces the show every week and I think he deserves a lot of credit for going through your questions on Twitter and giving me some juice to drink in the morning. It is Roka hey, Fett, John Roka. Hello, everyone. It's been a while. I'm stretching out my Star Wars muscles, getting yeah. ready in this cold studio to get warmed up. You know, you see the fire behind me uh, that <laughs> Vader's walking out of. Reborn! I can't wait to talk about this. And yeah, uh, I do enjoy reading all y'all's questions and stuff and the variety and the not variety of some of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the diligence and the stubbornness to ask the same question a week, hoping I select it. And uh, I appreciate because one day, you never know, Oh, I may just pick it. So I, I like it, yeah. You know, I used to have that task, uh, uh, Ed. One of, there was one guy, God bless him, I can't forget, because he, do, he doesn't tag me anymore. Right. Same five questions every week. Yep. And I would take a couple of them. I would take it, but yeah. I, I was never going to ask the question of will Dirge ever become canon again because <laughs> I try not to acknowledge the legends too much. Yeah. We're trying to get a little better about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a little better about that. I have to keep that perspective in mind for Mailbag. I like your oh approach gosh. to that, that, yeah. you, that you like, you know, the, the dedication and Yo. the persistence of asking the same question over and over. Yeah, I know what it's like to knock on a door until they finally open it, so I, rep I respect that. It all, <laughs> it's all a matter of timing. Do I read your question at the right time, fitting with the topics that we're talking about on the show, depending on the news items, mm -hmm. then if it fit so keep trying you may you never that know is, but i appreciate all the questions coming out it's really a, a lot of interesting questions that come from the fans that is uh, that is true you know it, it's how it fits into the show and speaking of fitting in the show we're gonna go into movie news Hey, dun, 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 we're going to our own personal hollow net of Star Wars news. And Roka, we're going to start with money, money, money. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is uh, not a surprise, but it's fun to talk about because it brings up the creator, George Lucas. Forbes ran a, uh, a story here of the wealthiest celebrity in America. And George Lucas. Still, he's like retired. He's building a library. He's off uh, married and having fun. His net worth, $5.4 billion. Billion. That's a lot of zeros, Roka. Now, yeah. mind you, when he sold Lucasfilm uh, to Disney for like, what, $4.01 billion, there was a thought. I, he, I know he gave a lot, if not all of it, away to charity because he could. So this is maybe factoring some of that stuff there. Um, and I'm sure he gets a... Yeah, little points on the back end for a lot of things there, too. As Carrie Fisher used to say, I look in the mirror, I have to give George a couple bucks. So um, <laughs> what do you think here? Not a surprise, but is there... There's one little angle I have on it, Perry, but I want to... Really? Get you well, he's still, like, at the top of the charts, and that's what... He's rode off into the sunset. Hmm. All this started with him scribbling down on a piece of paper in 1973, Work hard, kids. That's hard. the most incredible thing. And yeah. actually, it kind of speaks to uh, what you were just saying about the approach to getting a question in. It's like mm. you keep you keep pushing, you keep knocking on that door until it opens. And his door didn't just open; it freaking blew wide open. Yeah. And and look at the look at the impact he's had. And that's why he's on this list too. I mean, it is mm. largely because of that Disney deal. Yeah. And it just uh, it goes to show how what he created stands the test of time. Means so much to so many people out there. And 
then you go through the rest of the list, and <laughs> it's interesting to see uh, who is who is in uh, good company with him. Yeah. Steven Spielberg obviously makes a lot of sense to me. Oprah Winfrey, of course, Michael Jordan, and then uh, then we get to uh, Kylie Jenner. And, uh, <laughs> but really, not not to knock her because they're on this list for a reason. It's just yeah. interesting to look at this list and see how many different verticals that everybody hits. It's, and you know, she's <laughs> she's here because I, I guess she's got like a makeup empire or something. She, Kylie Kylie Cosmetics. I know Roka and I buy them a lot, but yep. yeah, Kylie Absolutely. Jenner, Jay Z. I get that nine hundred million, and then magician David Copperfield, eight hundred seventy five million. But Roka, yeah. we're old enough to remember when he went through the Great Wall of China That's on right. live TV. Yeah. That makes sense. And made a jet disappear. It made a jet disappear. So I don't Cody know. Hall, do you remember David Copperfield making a jet disappear? Cody is nine. He doesn't remember. No, he doesn't remember. He was an embryo when this guy was big. Look, listen, this is here's what's interesting to me about David Copperfield. How do we know his money's legit? Like, did he make it appear or is it really what he's earned eight hundred and seventy five million dollars? Because I don't know anyone that goes to magic shows anymore because we've seen so many of them and they've been exposed. Isn't by it now. like huge in Vegas though? Is it still? Because I, I would, it? I David would assume Blaine so. was the last guy I heard, David and they Blaine had that meme yeah. with him. You know, yeah. F you, David Blaine, with Harrison Ford said, "Get out of my house, David Blaine." That's great, which was Biggest, a great video big, if you haven't yeah. seen that. But David Copperfield still pulling it in, eight hundred seventy-five million. That's incredible. Uh, you big, know, once you show it on TV, you're like, I get it. Not really magic, but you, but people want to get, the, people want to escape, I guess. Yeah. And so you want to say that? I don't know what you can say about Kylie. I just, I'm happy that Lucas is up there at the top. That a creator is up there at mm -hmm. the top. That a person who's an artist creating things that will affect generations upon generations upon generations until the end of time. Yeah. I don't see Star Wars ever, ever going out of fashion. It will always be passed on, like what they write on the walls, those stories yeah. that the people wrote on caveman walls, like that kind of stuff. That's what I think Star Wars is. It's one of those franchises that will never go out. So yeah. the fact that he made five points, still makes five point four billion, or he's worth five point four billion, is not surprising to me. And I love that the man dresses like he could give a crap that he makes five point four billion dollars, just tucking in the, to, into the <laughs> pants. He don't care where and sneakers from like Rite Aid or something like yeah. he just does not care and I respect that like those Hawaiian millionaires down there wearing their Hawaiian shirts walking around with their flip flops and their shorts because they don't need to dress up they make all the money you know act like you've been there before exactly. sometimes what I say yeah and look I, I, I you're right they could never shoot another frame of Star Wars from this day forward and we know it's going to matter it's going to affect mm -hmm. generations after generations which is why we always talk about it. it's important to to keep passing it on and if you find a, a youngster that that is getting into Star Wars. Yeah. It's cool. Help, help, you know, beyond just showing them, you know, Galaxy of Adventures or Star Wars Rebels or something. Yeah, it, I, I love having those discussions and seeing Star Wars through the eyes of the, of the generations that come up behind. Yeah. Uh, and George Lucas is the creator. That's what they call mm -hmm. him. The capital T, capital C creator. He is the one. And I was watching a featurette yesterday, doing some research. It was back uh, during the Revenge of the Sith time, and it was a featurette uh, you can find on YouTube, uh, um, you know the the, the cho chosen one prophecy, mm -hmm. and to see Lucas, and again, it's he was making the movie back then, but to see him roll up his sleeves and just explain what's in his head about Star Wars and Anakin and everything. It reminds you that this this is his world. This mm -hmm. is this universe. You get that impression that he cares about everything he does too. Because I was just uh, because of Rule of Two, I was talking about this with the uh, with Mark and Mark the other day. I interviewed George Lucas one time, yeah, and it was for the movie Strange Magic, which <laughs> is not a good movie. Yeah. but hearing about it from him. It doesn't even matter that, you know, at that point in time, they had already gotten, you know, the general response and it wasn't so hot, yeah. but he was still so passionate about every single detail in that movie. And you could just, you could kind of feel that energy. And I think that, you know, hit or miss, that's what's important. And that's what keeps that creative energy going over time. And he definitely has it. He, he to me, is still, even now, a USC film student. Just mm -hmm. trying to make some art pictures mm -hmm. and tell his stories, and that's that to me is 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 the legacy of the prequels, mistakes, and I, I get it, I get it. But at the end of the day, this is this one man's kind of story, and and and, and this tale he's telling, and you have to respect that. And he's a maverick in a lot of ways. Well, and you look at the fact that like he came along when all these people were at the same time as contemporaries: Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese. These are all his contemporaries. Yeah. And here's the man sitting at the top of all his contemporaries, <laughs> 5.4 billion, and he's directed arguably way less number of films, yeah. volume-wise, than any of those guys in his in in his group from that time. And it's incredible that Spielberg has to direct and executively so many films just to be in the conversation. Right. 
location close enough to George Lucas. And that just mm-hmm. tells you sometimes when you create that thing that is, uh, that is uh, timeless, it will carry on forever and keep filling your pockets up, but also keep filling your creatively and giving you opportunities. Yeah. I'm going home for the first time in two years. And to see my nephew, who's a mass, who's becoming a massive Star Wars fan at seven years old, dressing up as Vader for a couple of years now, and all the different things, and I can't. And he loves Legos, so I like scour the internet to find the best Lego Star because I want to build one with him as an uh-huh. experience. Because I only get to go home once a year. This will be nice to do this with him and pass it on to him. Maybe even can't watch one of the movies with him. That would mean so what, much. What, what did you settle on? What Lego set did you? Well, get? they dropped the price on the Destroyer to 120. So I the had Star to, Story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Ooh. he's my I don't have my, that one. my nephew. Nephew is smart as a whip. It ain't because we're blood related. My nephew is smart as a whip. Okay. He's already like ahead in his science stuff. Like he's and they, my sister sent me a picture of him. He is like intensely focused, figuring out some science thing at seven years old. And so that just makes me envious of this intelligence at seven. I was like, yeah. you know, playing with transformers out in the yard in the dirt. So seeing him <laughs> doing this kind of stuff is incredible. So I yeah. want to foster how quick could the Lego things. He's already up yeah. into the ten year old things, and so that excites. You'll me be happy. You know what I just sent home to my little cousin? A big box of bumblebee toys oh, yeah. they already have everything and anything star wars related right. it's incredible how much stuff I mean, they I have. have i have my original bumblebee still Whoa, the really? tiny yeah. one. so i'll see how much that's worth and i'll sell it and maybe uh leave for go. the next month it's Make probably 5. worth 4 billion probably worth five bucks um <laughs> cool star wars legos uh, i could talk for an hour yep. when, when am i going to get that death star sets the question it's christmas time you guys oh. haven't Purchased it yet for me? I have not. It's only like $435. <laughs> Still want it. Okay. That and the USS flag from G.I. Joe in the 80s. Let's move on to Star Wars <laughs> Celebration. Chicago, mid-April. It's around my birthday, and it's going to be around something else. Hopefully cool, like announced soon for y'all. Um, but that's just my celebration. We're all going to be there, or some of us are going to be there. I'm not sure if I'll be there, but they're going to have this big party for five days. And it's been confirmed that Warwick Davis will return to host the Celebration stage mm. and I feel this is a great this is a fun story but it's also time to turn the spotlight onto one of the the best things about Star Wars which is Warwick Davis so share your Warwick Davis memories uh, <laughs> memories Perry. I've got memories yeah. and now I, I'm really hoping that I get to go because I've already been spoiled enough to go to celebration twice yeah. and just the energy there is so infectious. I walk around every single day of my life, a Star Wars fan, but it's mm. a different feeling when you're in that community and you're basically just living in it for however many days. And Warwick Davis is someone who kind of bolsters that a little yeah. bit. The second he steps out on stage, you could already feel the electric energy in the room kick up another couple of notches. Yeah. So there's really no one better to bring back to Celebration than him. Yeah, he's really great at it and like I said he's a good ambassador for the brand mm-hmm. and yeah I've run into him in like uh, the hotel lobby mm. and he just people just it's like <laughs> ah, it's, 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 it's a superstar there Roka though he be small he is fierce and so it's like it's nice to see this coming back and having him uh, coordinate and interview and run these things I, mean, I remember watching uh, what a couple years ago when they did the live feed of it it was so great to see and the reaction is fantastic as well because he's the connection to all the films to all yeah. the films and not just that Willow other things like you connect with so many levels with Warwick good. Davis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you love that, and it, it, it tickles every nerd's fancy to have him get involved in this stuff. Plus, you know, you don't see a lot of uh, 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 smaller people get these kind of opportunities to interview and do these kinds of things, right. and so it's great that he's so revered and loved by the Star Wars universe, and to uh, run Celebration the way he does. Yeah, and it's, and it's also great because uh, yeah, I, I, Wicket and what he did with Wicket. Mm. I mean, he's 11 years old. Yeah. He's not yeah. even supposed to get the role. Kenny Baker, I think, was supposed to do it as well. Uh, I know Jack Purvis was in there. I think Kenny Baker gets sick as the urban legend. And they're like, well, Lucas likes what this kid's doing with the Ewok thing. Throw him in there. Mm-hmm. Throw him in there. 11 years old. He been, had, had Kenner figures in his hands like two weeks ago. <laughs> and now he's opposite Kerry Fisher in, in, in a great scene, in a great sequence. And, and you know, I know the Ewoks do get uh, maligned over the years, but there's a, there's a joy to it. And, and you can never, when you see it for the first time as a kid, Return of the Jedi, that you, you, you're like, you're not worried that 
well, teddy bears. They're like, there you are. Yeah, yeah. It also goes back to what we were just talking about with George Lucas. One, it starts with the creation of this beloved brand, but it's also how many different verticals something like Star Wars can mm-hmm. hit. And mm-hmm. as a kid who was super young, when I first watched the original trilogy, I freaking loved Wicked. I loved yeah. all the Ewoks. Mm-hmm. I had to have every Ewok toy I could possibly find. And, yeah. you know, it, it's nice to have, uh, even though I know some people roll their eyes at, at certain Ewok elements in these movies, but but it's nice to have something like that, that when you, let's say, have a little cousin, a niece or nephew mm. or something, it, it's almost like a, a really appropriate entry point where mm. maybe they're not ready to wrap their heads around the adult characters and some of the themes and the ideas and the experiences they're going through. But you can always create that connection through something like an Ewok. Mm-hmm. And that was always really important to me. Absolutely. Uh, and this this new kind of t- tradition that Warwick is now a part of almost every movie mm-hmm. and, and, and Star Wars Rebels as Rook, uh, that's been fun too. And, and to see him in, in Solo get his kind of, um, you know, it, it's due in a way. I yeah. th- still think mm-hmm. he could do more, but the character of Weasel pops back up from Phantom, Phantom Menace, and that, that's a mask off. That's You actually get to see him. Yeah. That was a good... Uh, owed to him I thought yeah and then of course connect him with the Harry Potter franchise as well so mm-hmm. I mean the Warwick hits a lot checks a lot of boxes in the nerd world and it's fantastic to have him there um, I think also uh, what he represents um, just the connection to mm-hmm. the foundation of the franchise and that's important to come back and connect with something like that especially as we are talking about the end of the Skywalker solo franchise mm-hmm. of Star Wars films these nine films what is going to happen will will the, will the old traditions keep going you know and you hear that with Pixar how they have to have John uh, uh, what's his name from Cheers John Ratzenberg on mm-hmm. voice something on their every one of their films he's their good right. luck charm with J.J. Abrams Greg Gromberg is his good luck charm so yeah. they always have this Warwick Davis represents that and I wonder if his appearance at Celebration is like him closing the door on being a part of these movies as they move into a new trilogy new version of this I wonder I would read that as the exact opposite that he his, would, his his increased continue? involvement with something like a mm. celebration and also given what you just said he's he's popped up in other films and voiced characters mm-hmm. and it doesn't feel like he's reached his full potential I feel yeah. like he's capable of even more than he's already sure. given us and with the franchise continuing whether you're talking about big screen or the streaming service stuff there's there's really endless potential and the fact that he is such a prominent face for this brand for mm-hmm. this fan community I think that's a sure sign that they should give him more I think, yeah, let's do an, uh, a standalone film on uh, on the streaming service about his character, Weasel. What turned him from a petty thief on Tatooine to one of Infus Nest's lieutenants? Um, but Star Wars Celebration will be here soon. If you got your tickets, get ready, pack up. We're all going to Chicago. All right, this is the story here. All right, Roca. Yeah. I'm walking. I get here early. I go across the street to get my oatmeal because I'm 70 and my coffee. And uh, I go, Cody, you want something? I don't ask him for anything. And then uh, <laughs> Roka texts me, should we put this story in? Yeah. My first reaction is, over my dead body. But then uh, I read it, because Roka's smart. And I, I'm, I'm here to discuss it. This is from uh, Forbes, Scott Mendelson, mm-hmm. uh, who, who's a veteran in this industry. The title reads, Star Wars 9 must prove that The Last Jedi didn't ruin Star Wars. All right, I don't like titles like that, but there's a little bit more here. Mm -hmm. This gets into numbers, gets into business, which is why I'm glad we have a smart person here to talk about it, Perry Nemiroff, (laughs) who understands the music and the movie industry a lot better than I do in terms of numbers. So, Perry, let's dive in. What do you think about what's going on here? What's beyond the title? Well... A lot of this article and, uh, you know, I I respect the way it's written and some of the points that he brings up. I don't happen to agree with a lot of them. I think that... The Matrix Reloaded thing we're going to talk about? uh, Well, there's one thing, but... When it comes to predicting box office, I often resort to something like trends. Oh, this movie came out, and it's very similar to this movie that came out right around the same time in whatever year. I could look at that and say that this movie is likely heading down the same path. And I think that's what he's getting at a lot across the board here. But I also think there's so many factors that make some of these comparisons uh, kind of maybe useless, where... 
we're, we're just in a different time. And, and, you know, this weekend, for example, when we have so many major franchises adding another installment, you can't necessarily say, oh, because Bumblebee's coming out this week, I could go back to that other Transformers movie because we're it's a different ball game right now. And especially with where Star Wars is at right now and the fact that we don't have a Star Wars movie this month, it's like almost like all these other uh, installments from franchises are vying for that same money. So mm. the, the point is trends can help but sometimes they can help. And I think a lot of the examples brought up in this article, especially when you look at something like uh, BVS and Justice League. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Batman versus Superman response brought down the number for Justice League. That That's something I don't agree with because mm. I think there was, yes, a mixed response to Batman versus Superman, but we also had Wonder Woman in the mix. And I think that with how the DC film franchise was evolving between Batman versus Superman and Justice League, there was still a whole lot of excitement for all the upcoming properties. So, yeah, yeah, maybe Justice League was bound to not do as well as Batman vs. Superman, but I don't think you can necessarily point a finger at BVS and say, this is the reason why this one this one did not do as well. And because of this example, we're going to say Episode 9 is not going to do as well as it could have because of the response to Last Jedi. See, John? Mm, controversial that, comments. That is why, I though. I can't tell if that made me schwitz just now or the yeah. fact that you've been complaining and they pumped up the heat that that's they why I'm sweating. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. 55 degrees. I took my jacket off now. Yeah. It's nice and, nice and comfortable. I like it Letterman cold in here. Look, uh, John, this is why we bring Perry on the show. Yeah. She's got notes, which I think are great. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just say things like me like Porg. So that's why uh, Nine's going to do well. But uh, what do you take from that? You say there's some controversial statements. Yeah. Get into there, John. Well, Come first, on. First of all, I don't take self-deprecating and uh, Ken's self-deprecating act uh, with, uh, with. I take it with a grain of salt. Man's incredibly intelligent. Knows so much about so many things. That's why you guys love him as much as you do, and listen to him on the Napsock Files in the afternoons. But let me say this: Me porks like a lot. <laughs> porks is good. I can't wait for a pork sandwich on Christmas. Uh, listen, I want to say this. I think what Perry brings up is interesting. It's interesting to explore. Yes. Mm -hmm. How can you quantifiably say yes or no in this? Did BVS right. affect Justice League? Same people in BVS were in Justice League. Same people who directed uh, BVS directed at least most of Justice League. So that could be a connective tissue here. Yes, we had one woman in the middle, but who knows? So it's 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 a matter of opinion. And I think Perry's got every right to have your, her opinion as strongly as Scott does on his side. Scott and I used to work together, so I always read his stuff. Uh, we used to test videos back in the old days and wow. old IQC and Testronics back there testing videos. Uh, so uh, to see where he's come, it's been incredible. He was always writing. And so I read his stuff, his box office stuff, his analysis and analytical articles about the movie industry. What he brings up here, though, is interesting. In franchises, the first one is usually the one that makes yeah. the most money. The second one kind of drops off. And then the third one, no matter how good but it's, all installments it's, are, it's, it's still the third one that come, brings yeah. it back. And that's an interesting thing to explore. We're looking at it with legs. Lego Movie, yeah. Lego Movie making a, made a lot of money, surprised a lot of people. Lego Movie too, not getting as much buzz as the first one did. May not do well as well financially, but then the third one might come out and do better than the second one, but not as good as the first one. So there's possibilities here. You can't deny the Last Jedi at some point is it, it does affects a star a, a, a contingent of Star Wars fans and may affect them going in to see Episode Nine. If Episode Nine is a little on uh, half and half or has some troubling stuff because we saw that with Solo people stayed away from Solo I think as a reaction as a protest and so that may Someday. happen again with Nine depending on how the trailers go how the rollout goes and how people feel yeah so, so, some the Solo thing some did and, and I, I keep saying that I think a lot of people have slept on the movie and, and what I mean by that is they just didn't go see it and they've got yeah and they're Star Wars fans they're like ah and they're not even like against it they're, they're just no, like no 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 ah yeah yeah I go see it and that that, that I think has, goes to the marketing and the time mm -hmm. of the movie if Solo was out this weekend might be a different story Perry might actually like it I don't know <laughs> uh, we'll I see I think my opinion about the content of the movie uh, is the same <laughs> so uh, you, there's a lot of things that factor into this and, and what will Nine if Nine makes less does that mean it's proven anything? No, uh, but mm. I, I think there's a lot of pressure well, on it. It could mean something. I what think I think also my overall point was that 
in using these specific examples laid out in this article, it's it it is almost like the you know the apples to oranges cliches where mm. there's so many factors in play. Yeah. Yes, of course, BVS did something to Justice League, but there are so many other things to consider. And yeah. like the the Lego Movie example, mm. I think that was a little bit of anomaly, a, a little bit of an anomaly where they went not just from Lego Movie to Lego Movie Two, but it was Lego Movie and then Lego Batman, which everyone expected to mm. blow it out of the water in terms of box office, then that did not perform as well. And then Lego Ninjago brought it down even more. Yeah. And I think it's it's one big series, even though those yeah. aren't direct sequels to the first movie we got, it mm. is all together. So it's just that we're talking about so many different scenarios. And then you have to factor in the quality of the movie, because that's ultimately mm. yeah. what it's going to come yeah. down to here. I don't necessarily think you could look at episode nine and say, oh, like it means this for the Star Wars franchise or this for the Star Wars franchise, depending depending on if it makes more or less than Last Jedi. You have to consider how good the movie is and how everybody out there thinks it is too. And then when you compare both things, that's when you kind of can get a better representation of where Star Wars stands at the end of this trilogy. Yeah, uh, I think I think uh, Perry makes fantastic points. The, the, the concern is though, if it does come in less than Last Jedi, people will read that as that trilogy is done. We finished yeah. it. Didn't land didn't stick the landing overall like the prequels did, but or like didn't, in my opinion. Of course, your your opinion is different, Ken, but like it didn't stick the landing. Uh, so maybe it's in the middle between the, the original trilogy that did, the prequels that most people feel didn't, and then this lands somewhere in the middle, and then we move on, wrap that chapter, we're done. Uh, yeah. And I think if it does, if it, it, it yes, the quality of the movie absolutely thoroughly matters. But if it's not a good quality movie, then we've got real issues well, going on here. And I think the, the bigger door. issue is if, yeah. is if it's good. So let's let's say right, let's movie. just hypothetically yeah. say episode nine is screened for critics. Nobody likes it, and then also mm. the audience reaction is a similar reaction, and we see a number that is less than Last Jedi. Right. That would actually almost be the better scenario in my mind than if let's say the critical response was big and and let's say like last jedi it mm -hmm. got another a cinema score but the number was still coming down that to me would be mm. a sign of waning interest in star wars and more of a buildup of problems over time whereas if the movie was just plain old bad mm. i would feel like there'd be able to be at least a clean break between that and whatever path they mm -hmm. take next for the film franchise and whatever they're doing on the uh, streaming service too. The other version, it, it's more of like a, like a, di like almost like a, a deeper scar, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, that would scare me a the little more. The one you just presented. The, fir the first the first version one, where right. if it's really good and the numbers still go yeah. down, that to me is is the effect of a deeper scarring. And that's, that's certainly possible. Yeah. It could also be that people are just done with that story and they want new stories. That's certainly, and that's what I sense from Kennedy and, and them re-upping with Kennedy is they and especially what with the story we're going to get to here with Mandalorian and they're going in a whole new direction and this leads back to what I was saying about Warwick I think what we've seen progressively through this trilogy is they want to walk away from the old stuff and create new traditions new mythologies new stories and so definitely what Perry said that could be the interpretation the other interpretation is that people don't have an interest in that uh, story anymore at the level they did before because new generations are coming mm -hmm. up and they've been schooled on the prequels they've been schooled on other the things Clone Wars and they may and not stuff, have yeah. the connection to the OT that we do. So I don't know. It's it's certainly a, yeah. a lot of it's, balls in the air on this. It's show. look it, 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 it Perry's brought some really intelligent insight. Yeah. You have two Roka uh, and I'm over here. I, I look I, like I'm a ba major league baseball fan going back my whole life. I cannot stand uh, wins over replacement, exit mm -hmm. velocity, all these new stats. Analyticals. Analytical <laughs> stuff. You know what I like? Go out there and hit the ball, kid. <laughs> That's my view of it here, and I was I was looking at Co Cody Rhodes, we, one of my favorite professional wrestlers, yeah. tweeting with Dave Meltzer and some other people the other day about you could look at the business. If you do, you sell out a fifty thousand seat arena. If you don't, does that mean your product was bad? Uh, and that and that's part of it mm -hmm. too. But but we do have some metrics, and they're looking into some of that stuff. You know, there's things they know. It's like I was talking to someone who's a political consultant who, who helped run campaigns, and I was like, ah, I'm kind of kind of like an independent. She was like, we know down to what you buy at the grocery store. Mm -hmm what your things <laughs> are. Yeah. We know Everything's if, you're, if you're an R or, an, or a D. Mm -hmm. Independent, you might think you are, but da, da, da. And so I think that's some of the stuff that Perry's talking about here, too, is mm -hmm. like, I might say me like pork, but then they can look at some little numbers, the, the, the exit stretch. Though, exit polls, as we know, John, don't always tell the story. No, they don't. That's but for sure. Anyways, uh, Perry, that's why uh, 
we pay you the big bucks. I like talking about box office. Okay. <laughs> John, do you see the passion? In, oh, yeah. in Perry's uh, eyes. Every Monday on Movie Talk, I see the passion. Yes, absolutely. She's and it's, got this. It's always fun. I'm, I'm, gonna steal, I'm not going to throw it away. No. I'm not going to throw it away. Well, no, those are just, Holy, those that's are just, just yeah. points from the article. I just wanted right. to have the numbers that he Here's brought up Here's my notes handed. for today's show. It's copy. You have a computer there. I don't. Yeah, you know if, I, if, I, right if I had a computer on the table, I wouldn't have any notes like yeah. this. I, I have a team of people in a van. Then I send these thoughts out, and then they send me back. An earpiece? What to say. And an earpiece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, that does kind of uh, bring to a close the movie news section section of the show not a lot in movie news we're gearing up waiting for some stuff in episode nine uh when we're gonna get the for the title the trailer the teasers all that fun stuff i think a lot of that coming in 2019 that will kind of uh, turn our focus back to the movies but right now it's time to go to what's the deal with canon and well this is kind of where the fun is right now a lot of movement here as we look towards the streaming service TV, I don't believe there's going to be a movie in theaters in 2020. I think we can just start to uh, maybe mentally accept that. And uh, TV and comics and books, that's where kind of the focus is right now. This first story is an interesting one. I had a chance to meet this guy over at Screen Junkies back when he was just just had scored Creed, hmm. pr produced Heim's album, and which was one of my, their first album, one of my favorites. Ludwig Gorison is set to compose the score for The Mandalorian. He's gone on to do a lot of things since that moment uh, that I uh, had a chance to meet, meet him on the Nick Mundy show. Um, Creed, Creed Two, Black Panther. This guy's done a lot, and he's come to the Star Wars universe. John Rocco, what do yeah. you think about this? I, once again, this point I'm trying to make here, we're going into new directions with the Star Wars, skewing younger and younger, appealing to that demographic. Our time with Star Wars, we had 30 to 40 years with Star Wars. It was great. Now the new generation is coming in. These, uh, they understand. They want it. They want to keep it rooted in the store in the worlds that you remember. But they want to hire people who are going to bring new and interesting and fresh takes to Star Wars, both composing, directing, mm -hmm. acting, producing, what have you. And I think this is a great choice. This guy's. You want to get a guy on the or a person rather on the ascendancy. He is on the ascendancy with his scores. The Chiss ascendancy. The, well, I'm just yeah. here. A nice reference. But on the ascendancy with his scores, with his work, where he's at. He just did Childish Gambino's album. So, I mean, right. you got, this guy has his finger on the pulse on a lot of uh, things that we're talking. We mentioned Kylie Jenner in our first story. That's that, that, Those are those are the people that are moving you the You want needle. Kylie Jenner? I don't. Kylie Jenner I Star don't. Wars is what Roka but, said. I don't, but you got to take the society as a whole. And young people are getting into things in a certain way. Childish Gambino is someone, Donald Glover, who, of course, is part of the Star Wars franchise as solo. This is, this is all great stuff. I like this idea that he's been hired. I like it. There was no better timing to be covering the story because I happened to just watch a rewatch Black Panther last mm. night. And there are so many moments in that movie that I'm almost taken out of the movie by how good the score is. Mm. In particular, he just aces so many scenes. It's very difficult to jump from one scene to the next and have it feel natural. And there are so many moments where his score kicks in in just the right way mm -hmm. that it propels you from one moment to the other where you don't necessarily think about it, but it also ups the energy. Mm. And I just, I want more from him. I'm so excited. And another really cool thing about this story is oftentimes when they announce something like this and, you know, you read the official press release or whatever it is, you get a quote from the talent involved. And I can almost predict what that quote is going to be. <laughs> oh, it's such an honor. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Happy to be in a galaxy five far away. Re you got to read his quote. What's he that is a, It's a real. Perry, oh, you read uh, that quote. <laughs> I, I hope I can find it in uh, this mess. Okay, wait, yeah. here. Um. Words fail to express how surreal and humbling it feels to be invited into the Star Wars universe. I am deeply grateful to John Favreau and Disney for this opportunity and to John Williams for raising the bar so high with his iconic, intrepid scores. They will never be matched. In these next months, I hope to honor the tradition of Star Wars musical landscape while propelling the Mandalorian into new and uncharted territory. And I will try to remember that there is no try. Brilliant. That's great. I'm a, I mean, I was already on board. Now I want to vote for it's, him for president. That's it great. It just seems like a, a beautiful balance in that one statement about him respecting the past, knowing that I can't necessarily top what someone like John Williams right. did, but I am prepared to push it to another level as best I can. And I, I just, I, I respected him respecting John Williams that way. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, and I think John Powell did a good job saying that too. And, and, and uh, who, who did this? Uh, Giacchino did the Robo Michael score. Giacchino, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, I gotta get ready for Schmodown Spectacular 2 tomorrow. Um, <laughs> oh God. Yeah, uh, 
it, it's such a, you just know you can't you can't top Williams uh, even if even if you, you you do in some regards and I think I think there's great moments in the in the in the Rogue One score I think the the your father would be proud track is one of oh, my favorite yeah. moments uh, I think John Powell I think the arrival of the Marauders and a lot of things he, he's done uh, in that are really good and taking it you know a lot of the other pieces so uh, Ludwig Gors has got this challenge because it is something we've never really seen live action Star Wars TV Kiner Kevin Kiner who I do I agree with Christian I think I'd love to see him get a chance and I thought this might have been the spot because Floney's on board but you got to make some some big bold moves and John this is this is a good move yeah I do I, I, I and once again I think also the connection here that he could be like a recon soldier going into the Star Wars universe for Ryan Coogler and the mm -hmm. Russo brothers having composed for stuff on community <laughs> with the Russo brothers That's and right. having composed a lot a number of films including what Perry just said Black Panther for Ryan Coogler you send the recon soldier and see how his experience is like he comes back and reports to everyone this was a blast you got to come into this thing this. and then you know you got yourself I another a, a general a couple of generals coming in <laughs> I to, love to, this to image Marshall's of Ludwig who's just a rock star yeah, look at, look at that it look, 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 looks like he opened up for uh, Leonard Skinner in 72 there uh, <laughs> he comes in there and uh, uh, maybe more of the Flying Burrito Brothers I don't know comes in there and, and is like Coogler Russo's yeah it's good to go let's do this <laughs> let's go in can you imagine a Coogler uh, I would love Star Wars a, movie a Great. Coogler Star Wars movie yeah. Ooh, I like that a lot. Um, so yeah, that's interesting there mm. too. So, and hey, look, we got. I'm I'm hoping Dan and Dave can bring in Raman Jawadi, who is a rock star as well. Uh, we know eventually the generation will be passed, as Yoda says. We we are what they they grow beyond, mm -hmm. and this is uh, exciting news. All right, speaking of the Mandalorian again, it keeps on rolling. Uh, I always give him. I got to give him credit, man. Uh, uh, making making Star Wars that team's been on it, uh, probably to Disney's uh, annoyance. They've been <laughs> on some of these things. Uh, uh, I don't know what wall they're peeking over, but they're getting some good stuff. So this is for The Mandalorian. If you don't want to know anything, and often I don't, spoiler alert goes up from Cody here. Um, but this isn't giant big plot things. So even someone like me who, who really doesn't like spoilers, I think we can talk about it here. But that's your warning. All right. They're reporting that uh, The Mandalorian will reportedly feature classic Star Wars characters, bounty hunters even, IG-88 and Boss. Now, Boss, of course, was mentioned in Solo. Kasdan, John Kasdan, really wanted to include Boss some way, somehow. Um, but now we're getting reports that uh, we're going to have this. So this is interesting, fun. This is, you know, uh, people want this bigger connect. They want to know. They want to see the classic names they know uh, in some of the movies. And when they don't get it, they get upset. And then sometimes when they get it, mm -hmm. Gold Leader was in Rogue One. How dare you? That's just a nostalgia pull. So it's just, it's a, again, is it anything? It's so tough. But Perry, we might have you know, Zuckus, Forlom, they might be coming along too. It feels like a very appropriate nostalgia pull to me. It, it sounds like one that makes sense. Mm, yeah. And that's when it's not good, when it feels like it's shoehorned in just for fan service and right. nothing more. But I mean, wouldn't it make sense for characters like them to appear in a show like The Mandalorian? And Really, when I just uh, looked over my shoulder and looked at that image, that that's what I want to see. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to see I don't want to see um, just uh, any kind of, uh, you know, animated or hand drawn interpretation. I want another in the flesh, yeah. a bunch of bounty hunters mm -hmm. together in the same frame. I don't know if that's specifically what we're going to get. Right. But the fact that they're all involved in the same live action product just it, it's got me hyped. Yeah, it's it's yeah, I know what you mean. Like at Bosk you know, is great in the Clone Wars mm -hmm. uh, pops up there. Uh, the an IG88 there is an absolute cult of IG88. Hell yeah. Uh, Darina, who was here last week, loves IG88. Yeah. Mark Donica loves IG88. Uh, do you love IG88? IG88. Uh, when back when we did that. Uh Old school Kenner plastic figures battle. Uh, Jedi Alliance? Uh, Jedi Alliance. That's right. Jedi. Shout IG out to Maud Garrett and the Star Wars figure battles. That's right. And all those guys, Mike Black there for the first time. Yeah. So many just walked into the world of Star Wars figures even more powerfully in that episode. IG-88 was the one that we were like pushing to kind of win this whole thing. And I love I love him overall, or it overall, <laughs> as a bounty hunter. Uh, so I love that this is going to be highlighted. And the Mandalorian, what Perry says, right, the Mandalorian is a perfect place for these people to exist. 
where it's set, the time that it's set, and we it, the clamor amongst the Star Wars fans to see a bounty hunter show or a show about bounty hunters. Now you can kind of split the difference a little bit right. here, having them in the Mandalorian. You know, I just want to see him say, "I am Boss, son of Kratos." I want to see Boss say that <laughs> once. And uh, you know, he used to, his dad used to hunt Wookies. Yeah. Now are Wookies in play in the Mandalorian with Boss rolling through? Is he going to follow his father's tradition? So there's so much to play around with here. And wh how much vicious are we going to see from IG88? Do we finally see him fully realized, fully realized. in his in his uh, ability for violence and carrying out what he needs to do as a, a bounty hunter? So I'm excited overall. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, this series is fun. It's interesting to me because this continues to... Uh, the Mandalorian is not Boba Fett. To, nope. To what we know. Um, but I'm convinced that I think Favreau and his team wanted it to, to be about Boba Fett, so they're throwing... It's, it's even more confusing because I've had conversations <laughs> with casual Star Wars fans uh, who are like, oh, is this, like, is this about Boba Fett? No. Well, it's... He's got a Boba Fett, on, he's, and he's got Bosk and IG-88. It's not about Boba Fett. It's not, not that we know of. <laughs> it might be more about Cobb Vanth than we know about, but it's, it's, uh, it's fun. And it continues to roll, this next story here, uh, about Nick Nolte's possible role. We know Nick Nolte is in, look at that beard. That's the beard I want in two <laughs> oh. weeks. I'm going to have that much gray in about a month, I think, and that's what I'm going to look like. Um, it happens fast, kids. It happens fast. Uh, I uh, th th this is another report that he will be voicing a role, which is something I've uh, I'll give myself credit for. I've been saying I think he's a, a voice. I think he was seen around the office, not the set, and uh, that uh, he might be an ugnot. Speaking of references mm -hmm. and classic things. We don't know which Ugnot. We don't know if he's the one walking away talking to the other Ugnot when Lando's walking around explaining his new business, John. But yeah. you like this? Did you want to see Nolte rolling around as a crusty bartender? Like, eh, I kind of did. I, I, look, Ugnots have appeared in so many uh, uh, pieces of Star Wars media. I'm excited now to get a Nick Nolte grizzled mm -hmm. voiceover Ugnot. I mean, the Ugnots are known for living like 200 years, dealing with periods of uncomfortableness more longer than other people. Man. So you know he's already You crotchety. know more about Ugnots than I ever thought I'd want to know. <laughs> I'm just saying, these guys are crotchety. Uh, they're moody. They're responsible for building Bespin. <laughs> and so uh, I, love, I love that we're getting... It's like me when I worked here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A crotchety a Nick Nolte doing an Ugnot would be great, and I, I want to see what his participation in this whole thing is, because you know he'll be be almost like Gimli in Lord of the Rings ah. telling that truth about what's actually happening I like and that. also having the bravado of the situation. That, you know, I love that. That's a point, Roka. That's great. That's a great explanation and a, and a yeah. great a theory on what that could be. And I'm now more on board than I thought I was <laughs> here in Nolte grumpy, uh, grumpiest way through a Ugnot right. there. Uh, Perry, what do you think? Uh, I will take Nick Nolte in Star Wars in any capacity. When that was first announced, I still couldn't believe it was actually happening. And I don't know if maybe I heard it from you or somewhere out yeah, there yeah. but I had a feeling he was going to be voicing someone. It's just fascinating to me that if this report is fully accurate, mm. he could knock out all of his voice work in a single day yeah. and then just be a part of but, one of the greatest yeah. film franchises I think that's what he time. did. I don't even know if he knows it's a Star Wars. <laughs> he's, uh, he's probably like, <laughs> what about I just read this line. The, the tech though that they use to bring this character to life between his voice work, having someone physically perform the role on set and whatever this, this like mm -hmm. facial apparatus yeah. is That's to actually the, make that happen this is fascinating but that goes to back to i think it was joe russo's comments mm -hmm. up at the i think it was at the collider q a you were probably there i was stuck I in the lobby not. you were not no i was uh i had to see something else to do some interviews how dare you i Perry. know i was i was excited for <laughs> the interviews a little that, bummed to have missed yeah it. that thing that joe russo saying that like this there's some some technological mastery going on here that Favre's shooting this in an interesting new way. Mm -hmm. uh, even with Bosk, I mean, who knows? We might get a lifelike, you know, Bosk moving. I, this is really exciting there. And I think, I think in the end of the day, Nick Nolte in Star Wars is very oh so minty fresh to me. So, uh, yeah, any any final thoughts there, Ugnot? Werner Herzog is the rumor to is oh, going to be in this too. As well. yeah. Him, Carl Weathers. So just having Werner Herzog maybe have a back and forth with Nick Nolte is mind blowing to me. I don't, I would not do this if <laughs> what force. are you doing? Let me tell you <laughs> about alone. the force. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love Werner Herzog's very soft lilting. Yeah. The only reason I go see his documentaries or movies yeah. is to hear his voice uh, is lilting. He, uh, he's a walking, talking voice. ASMR video, and I love it there. <laughs> uh, so Nolte, sorry, and yeah, and the cast. I mean, we got. It's it's fun stuff yeah. shaping up, and I don't even think we're done with the cast of oh, Mandalorian. No. This is the main cast; it's the official announcement. We know there's going to be other players. You know, I'm excited. Even not only Bryce Dallas Howard 
directing, but I'm sure she's got to have some role in it. Yeah. That's a loss if you don't have her in there. There's an exciting uh, a group of characters shaping up here. Right, Perry? I'm pumped. You're I, well, pumped. I, I really, I, I want this for so many reasons just yeah. to dive into this world. But yeah. Also in my, you know, box office predicting, you know, mm-hmm. future of the industry, predicting loving brain. I'm just so curious to see what happens when all of this is actually unleashed. Because right, right now there's, there's, I, I think someone said it before, so many kind of like balls in the air. Mm. We don't really know how this is all going to shake out. I got a lot of faith. faith. Clearly they have so many incredibly talented Talented people involved. This yeah. is going to be major for Disney and for the Star Wars franchise when this comes out. Yeah, and then it's just going to spurn more. We're going to have more season twos, new shows. The way it's be, the way it's being cast too. Like Jean Claude Van Damme is not out of play. It's it's <laughs> you've okay. been putting Carl Weathers in Let, there, brothers. Jean Claude yes, Van Damme is not out of the room. Dolph Lundgren is not out of the room possibility. Right. Let's dive Stallone. into that. Is is it? I mean, because I love Carl Weathers. Yeah. I loved him in the 80s. I loved him in Arrested Development. I think this oh, is a great... Right. I think this is great. Yeah. I loved him in Happy Gilmore. Come on. <laughs> Go to your happy place. I I love this, but it is... It's it's not of the realm of possibility. These, these, these little, you know, renaissances of, of yeah. older performers. And I love, too, that this is an older cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe uh, uh, my pal Scripshaw said, uh, Joseph Scripshaw told me that the youngest so far is Gina Carano at 36. Yeah. So this this is definitely, you know, you got Force of Destiny, Galaxy Adventures. Now they're like, cool, you old crusty fans, we got got something coming mm-hmm. down the pipeline for you. Yeah, who's your, who, who, you, who would you like to see? I, J- I would love to see JCVD, man. That that would be awesome to have him <laughs> doing slide this in. little dance. Because I mean, the way they're setting this is not the you know the prim and proper Star Wars with Luke and you know, the uh, big themes. This is down in the dirt in the grunt, and this is where you find these action heroes doing the things that they're doing, so they can be a part of this Star Wars, and it would feel authentic, right? Yeah. There's levels throughout, and so you could have him. You have a lot of these former action stars from the '80s and '90s, whatever, slide yeah. into these roles real effortlessly, and it would be believable if they're you know carrying out these bounty hunter missions or doing whatever they're doing there. Love There's it. a lot to explain. in those bars doing whatever there is. It's all kinds so of things. So John Rocha wants Jean-Claude Van Damme in Star Wars. Yes. Perry, give me a p- pick here. The first person that came to mind was Sylvester Stallone, Stallone because right. who JT's knows? JT's going to be happy. Yeah. Who knows He's going to jump off happening. his bird and hit a mailbox and really be happy. Who knows what's happening with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, so mm, why yeah. not take someone who is already under the Disney umbrella and just nudge him over to another franchise? I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, I've talked about it on Force Center. I gave this answer there. I'll back it up. I'm Madeline Stowe. Stowe would be great. Mm. Come on, my favorite yeah. uh, actress of all time. And then I really want, maybe not Mandalorian, Maybe season two Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. I want Emilio Estevez. <laughs> I want Billy the Kid. You guys know Young Guns, Young Gun 2 is actually my favorite movie franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, I want Emilio Estevez. Is, want C- is Cynthia Rothrock out of the equation? I no. suppose maybe. Probably, I mean, it's certainly no possible, other, right? <laughs> All right. Final thing here in Canon, then we're going to start talking to you guys here in the audience. Uh, we are live. So you've got a question. Use the hashtag Collider Jedi Council. One of us will find it on our computer machines. Um, Darth Vader 25 came out this week, and I, uh, I didn't think I was going to talk about it because usually I get my comics about two, three weeks later. I cheated on my comic shop. I read it digitally because <laughs> um, it just the, the buzz was too big. I've been loving this series. I think issue one through 25, this is the close of the series by Charles Soule. I think it's the best work Marvel's put out. I think there's been some great moments, great successes. Some of them go a little wonky. Mm -hmm. Some of them are a little too sci-fi. But that's not bad. This is where you can do it in the comics. I don't really like where the main line's going right now. It's a little weird. Though Han Solo shirtless chopping wood's not bad at all. (laughs) Um... This, though, start to finish, has been the best. That said, I, uh, I'm i not taking to these last few issues, if I'm being honest, like other people are. But, John, you're very excited. Perry, yeah. have you had a chance to catch up to it? No, I'm right. not. So, Perry, you can take a I break. Know. John, No, let's dive in here. Yeah, you I might get them. spoiled. Spoiler. Don't get spoiled. If you haven't read the series, Darth Vader, number 25, yeah. is out. Just came out yesterday. This All wraps right. it up. This, this wraps, wraps it, up. it up. This wraps it up. The journey he's been on, this wraps it up. Vader's been, for the last four or five issues, Vader's been on Mustafar, yeah. building the castle. Yeah. Ancient Sith Lord Momin shows up. It's Alex Damon uh, from Star Wars Explains, favorite Star Wars character of all time. Mm-hmm. That's what he's going to lose tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> nice. they've had some trouble building the castle. Yep. Took nine or ten attempts. There's some been some possessions with Momin. And kind of coming back from the dead in a weird way, opening up kind of this portal, maybe promising Padme will return. Yeah. John, 
Where does it end up here? Well, I love this is like if you ever remember The Sopranos, he has all these fever dreams once a season. And this mm -hmm. is what this is in a way. It's a vision quest. It's a vision yeah. quest. Walks in there. The, the, the way it's drawn is fantastic. His, you know, he's, it, it, they show Beautiful. him yeah. being in essence still scarred up facially and bodily. But like it's, it's a way that you can watch. It's not disgusting to look at. So he's and then he's seeing images of his life, like shades coming in, almost like your life flashing before your eyes before you die. Right. Seeing himself as a young kid, seeing the vision of of. Darth Vader in the shadow of himself, which is an, which is a shout out to the poster of Phantom Menace. All of oh, that, great, yeah. right? All that, and then you see the pod racing stuff, and then you see the stuff with his mom, with, with Shimi, and all this, and then you see this panel where Palpatine, in essence, yeah. it kind of infers that Palpatine bore a created Anakin inside Shimi's stomach and cre and, and, and in essence created the life that is Anakin. The you know, like almost like the idea of the Virgin Mary and Jesus, this idea of a virgin birth. And so it was fascinating. That is a possibility now that's in play. I know you have your thoughts on that, which right. I'm sure you'll get to, Ken. But then what he, the journey, he goes on through this whole thing. And then he does see, he kills all these Jedi. And then he sees Padme and loses her again. And that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that whole journey. That's what it was about. It was about letting go of the death of your loved one, letting go once and for all of her and moving on, you know? Mm. And I thought that was really gutsy of this series to end it that way, because right, she is his last human connection till Luke shows up, yep. human connection to who he was before. Now, at okay. the end, as he walks out, reborn in the fire, he is Vader fully now. I like that, John. I like that. That's what I'm saying. John? Good analysis. <laughs> no, I like it. That's, that's what I love about Star Wars. That's what I love. Uh, and I'm not a, a box office number critic. I'm not a critic. I'm not a critic. Uh, I am a Star Wars pundit. I am a, a seven-year-old boy who suddenly found himself on YouTube talking about Star Wars. Um, I love looking at things and finding the little moments. And, and it's art. So it's going to be, you're going to react to it different. But it's also, there's also answers in there. So what you're describing, it, it's got me re-excited to revisit this issue that didn't excite me initially. Mm. I think I was focusing on on the reveal, mm -hmm. and I got to be honest, I, I I just my one of my favorite scenes in Star Wars is 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 Squid Lake uh, opera scene in in Revenge of the Sith, the not from a Jedi scene, the Plagueis scene, mm -hmm. and I always took it as Palpatine saying, Plagueis knew how to create life, he taught his apprentice, wink me, mm -hmm. everything, and I killed him, and then I used his skills. Mm -hmm. I'm your father, essentially. I always kind of took it as that. So I think maybe I was focusing on. What was this mm -hmm. reveal? And and that one was like, okay, cool. But what you're talking about, what how it ends mm -hmm. with Vader saying yes, because Vader says no. We right. see that a lot, and and he doesn't answer Palpatine. He answers himself, and and it leaves it open like any good art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's 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 plus there's a painting you can hang on your wall. Perry, <laughs> if you walked into my home studio and that was hanging there, would you be afraid? Or? Well, when I walked into this studio and I saw it on that screen at first, yeah. I'm like, wow, that's that's freaking stunning stuff. You've sold me on this particular series before, mm -hmm. where I keep meaning to find time to mm -hmm. catch up and buy it all and actually just plow through it. But yeah. This is got, the one. Got, got a couple more movies to watch to close out the year, and then maybe this will wind up on the iPad. <laughs> over Christmas break there, uh, <laughs> over the holiday break there. Uh, yeah, it, from start to finish, what you're describing too, Roka, this is what Charles Soule did mm -hmm. well. And by the way, yeah, so I don't, I didn't really react well, not well, I, the character moment, mm -hmm. I don't take the Old Republic stuff too much. This is why, you know, I always get yelled at when I'm on Twitch, play Knights of the Old Republic! I'm gonna go play Red Dead Redemption 2. There's, I got nine more <laughs> dinosaur bones to find. Um... <laughs> Uh, I just I just don't take to it as much, but it, it exists in the story, exists in the lore, so I do want to learn more about it. But 1 through 25, Charles Soule took us on this journey through Vader. It goes, you know, moments after Revenge of the Sith, a little jump in time. There's some kind of craziness, but it's and it ends with this... It's, it's a vision quest mm -hmm. in this weird way. Mm -hmm. And so that I can get behind it. And I still think... Perry, grab the trade paperbacks if you can, or, you know, John will loan you some of his copies. Sure, I'll give you my Comixology subscription. There you, you go. Catch oh, up sure, why way. not? Yeah, so I mean, it is definitely yeah, getting the Star Wars universe talk in there, so yeah. we're excited about that. But we have about 10 minutes left, uh, nine if Cody gets lunch, so uh, <laughs> let's let's go through some questions here. Uh, we got some pre-selected ones from John Roca, and we got some ones coming in live. We're going to start with this one. Speaking of pro wrestling, here's one of the best heels working in wrestling today, Greek god Papadon. Uh, my friend Papadon and John. 
John, yours. Yep. We got to see him in action down mm-hmm. there in uh, uh, downtown LA a couple months ago. Good guy. Uh, good guy indeed. Uh, great heel. But he asks this, with the theory of Sidious actually draining the life force from Padme to save Anakin and Mustafar, do you think the good Luke feels invader is actually Padme. So this ties in a little mm-hmm. bit. Someone asked us uh, as well here online. I want to give them credit. Uh, this is uh, Shane Stahl uh, says, hey, do you think they'll reference Padme in episode nine? They aren't shy about it here. A lot of Padme stuff coming up. Mm-hmm. I love it. Underrated character. John, I'm going to start with you. We have this theory. We know. Yeah. It's a theory and it's a fun one. I'm always up for a good theory. Yeah. Palpatine took from Padme to Save Vader. Yeah, I can I can see it. It's fun. Yeah. What do you think about this? I, I, I like the theory. It's certainly interesting to explore. Uh, I don't like, I don't like the overall point of the theory, which is you know taking the essence of a woman to save a man. You know, I think it's kind okay. of it's a little uncomfortable nowadays sure. to have that kind of theory. But that being said, it's certainly possible. The bones are there to make that theory work. But do you think the good Luke feels in Vader is really is actually Padme? I don't want to believe that because then it ruins that end of the Return of the Return of the Jedi moment between Luke and his father, uh, where he, you know, he, he, he you know, uh, you have already saved me. You've already saved me, right. and it's because he's still good. And if you watch Clone Wars, you do see the good in Anakin and his relationship with Snips, with uh, Ahsoka Tano, and all these other places. It is a better, uh, pro- it's a better representation of Anakin's good and evil side in the Clone Wars. So that, I don't believe the good is just Padme. It's sure right. good because you are the connection of both, and it's certainly when you find the love of your life the good she or he or she gives you you always carry with you in your essence so that could be possible that's what they say every relationship you learn something from John that's right, right? And you and I have learned a lot oh my god we've learned a lot we could write books <laughs> Perry, I've what do you think about nothing. this? <laughs> um, I love this theory. I love it so, so much. And I kind of want it yeah. to be the real deal. And actually, I mean, I don't really read it as like a man versus woman kind of mm. thing. It's just more so the pure love that exists between them. And if, let's say, you know, in terms of force using and where they fell with the force, they were just on opposite sides. Mm. Anakin would be able to have his life force used to save her. Right. So that's, that's why that gets a pass in that respect for me. But I never, even after I first discovered this theory, I never read it in a way where by taking her life force that made her a part like mm. like her consciousness in a right. way part of him so yeah. that's why I don't think that it's actually going down this path and I don't think it should because of the moment that you mm-hmm. just brought up it would completely change the meaning of that right right yeah yeah and, and, and like I, I like the idea that Palpatine just use this moment to completely lie to Vader, yeah. one of his continued mm-hmm. moments which is what the Charles Soul comp and this issue, issue 25 he says, Palpatine's like much like Obi Wan, truth is what you make of it. He there. Said, and he says the universe is full of lies. Full of lies. It's harder to find an out <laughs> honest truth. So yeah. I love that Vader kind of learns, like, oh wait, the whole thing that kind of locked me into this prison was a lie from my boss. Oh, I don't know if I like mm-hmm. that there. So that's why this theory I've never fully bought into. But it, it does. It's exciting. Like, and I, I like it. I like it. It's very Game of Thrones. Like, it's, it's a way more satisfying end for her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that, but, but. I, I can't defend her her just losing her will to live. That's one of my least favorite moments in the prequels, mm. even though I love the prequels. But I just like it. If that exists, then I like the idea that Palpatine mm. uses that to lie to Vader. Well, I think that's why I like 25 again, because yeah. what she does in the vision is she takes her own life on purpose. Like, she mm-hmm. makes the decision to do it. Not that she lost the will to live, which is kind of an inaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the vision that you see in 25, it's an action mm. to remove herself from his life because yep. she sees that he will never be what she fell in love with first and can never save him from being uh, from that which his path, path is chosen. I like it. All right. Well, I pap it down. I hope we uh, put your question over enough there. All right. Andrew Fantasia writes this. This is just some episode nine speculation. And I do like that from time to time. Uh, on uh, Of the new episode nine actors, which is Naomi Aki, Richard E. Grant, Dominic Moynihan, uh, we got Carrie Russell and Matt Smith. Who do you think is most likely to use a lightsaber in the answer could be none what do you think perry none none i definitely think it's none we i mean because i'm i'm so steeped in this right now because of rule of two the other day we we basically spent an entire hour plus Mm -hmm. trying to theorize about what could happen and one of the points that was brought up was specifically laying out not just major leading characters in let's say ray and finn but all the characters around them now and all of a sudden this has to you know it doesn't necessarily have to completely close the book for all Mm -hmm. of them but they got so many character threads to tie 
tie up and at least find some sort of satisfying conclusion that I feel like if you went as big as to put a lightsaber in any of these new characters' hands, that would just, that would create a whole nother thing that I don't think that movie has enough time to handle. I like that analysis, yeah, John. I think that's a very good analysis and I, I thoroughly agree with it and, and I would say, um, I like that, once again, what I, my theory is I'm going through this show today, this idea that they want to move on from the past. And it's very clear, the say lightsabers represent the past. And what Perry says is right, like they would spend so much extra time explaining this idea of who's, why this person wielding the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get one of them in a flashback. Once again, Star Wars doesn't really do flashbacks. So who knows how they're gonna work that into this equation. But I don't think you need another person handling lightsabers. Already you have Rey and you have uh, Kylo. These are the two that you need to have the battle mm -hmm. with. If Finn picks it up again and starts doing something with it, I think that would turn me off. If, God forbid, Poe picks it up, that would turn me off. So mm. to me, these are the two that you need to see in the lightsaber duel at the end. Maybe we'll see Knights of Ren uh, or if they show up with their lightsabers, but I think it should be limited to these two and move on to other concepts. Even that Darth Vader comet presents the idea of other concepts besides using lightsabers. All right, like if I have to choose, I'm going none. Uh, if I if I have to say someone, <laughs> I, I will go with... I think it, uh, Dominic Moynihan and Matt Smith being some kind of mm. Knights of Ren team, even though I'm not super excited about Knights of Ren, but like it there. All right, quickly, two more. I want to get two more in. Cody, I'll pay for your sandwich. All right. Uh, Brandon <laughs> Porter asked this one, uh, and I, I have to ask this with, with two cinephiles like yourself here. <laughs> uh, in your honest opinion, which Star Wars film is the best cinematography? This stressed me out when I read <laughs> this. That's why we're doing it, yeah. It, it's very <laughs> difficult for me to come up with uh, with a, an actual choice that I feel 100% confident in without not, not only just rewatching all the movies, but I mean re-watching them all multiple times and then making mm -hmm. lists weighing one against the other, but I, I think I have to give the credit to Force Awakens, and it's because of one, you know the shot, and you know the score that has this effect on me every freaking time. The half a board drinking water. Exactly. <laughs> no, um, when March of the Resistance kicks in, and you get that side shot of the X-Wing swooping in to yeah, help save Han, Chewie, and Ooh, Finn. Bum, bum, every freaking time. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen that movie. I listen to March of the... It's like in my yeah. running mix. I'm not just talking about listening great, to that score straight through, but it's the combination of those two things in that moment that might make it one of my favorite moments of Star Wars overall. It's And you know what? Because I, I love Force Effects. I just think the whole movie looks too clean for me. Like A lot of it looks like it was shot on a soundstage, and they are. Shocker. They're not really in space. But that scene, to it's me, so beautiful. is what looks almost like some... The shots in Rogue One, which I love Rogue One there. John, that's not my answer, though, John. Yeah, Rogue One came real close for me because yeah. I really love the cinematography in Rogue One yeah. and what they're able to convey with just those different environments they go in. And we see a, a tropical planet, which we've never seen in mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. film. This really, But I have to still give it to Empire Strikes Back, not mm -hmm. just because it is my favorite film, <laughs> yeah. but because the cinematography on Hoth, then the cinematography on, da in, on Dagobah, then the cinematography up there in Cloud City, then the, all, that, all that happens, all the different environments that take you to, and the shots they have as you're entering in these environments right. are really powerful and moving and that's you know, the fight scene between Vader and Luke the first one in Empire Strikes Back and then the uh, the uh, putting uh, Solo in Carbonite the reflection and the lights yeah. and the, yeah, yeah. the gas coming up and Hoth all of that good. moment doesn't live unless the cinematography is absolutely on point and the lighting so to me all around it carries a yeah. lot of emotion yeah, and I had, to look, I had to look this up because I know Gil Taylor did New Hope and mm. he hated you know not hated Lucas but he was like oh kid let me show you how you he's British let me show you how to do it there. Right. Uh, Peter Szyszczyk. I don't. You can't say the name. That's that's a trivia question. I don't think I would have pulled out. Uh, you know, Ooh. cinematography. I know Steve Yedlin did episode eight. Right. Um, so Empire's a great chance. That that might be. That's tough to say. I'm gonna get murdered for this. And I, I don't. All right. I can't necessarily best. Best might be Empire. Might yeah. be what you're talking about. <laughs> Love. Solo. I love the look of wow. Solo. I love how dark it is. I love the. Re I love Bradford Young. I love how we said no. We're going natural. It yeah. feels like what I imagine Star Wars would be when I'm on the playground. It feels real to me more than any other. Vandor looks real. Everything about it. And I'm going to get murdered for it because that's, <laughs> that's one of the things people. Eh, it's too dark. It's too the beginning. The blue hues. And I will say this. I saw one of the first guys. I think the the premiere, the screen. One of the first things I saw. Beautiful. The first opening scene, great. I did go see it at, uh, I think it was an arc light. And it was too dark. It wasn't, but it wasn't Bradford Young stuff. It was something about the presentation of it. And I do understand that complaint. But I just, Savarine to me, beautiful. <laughs> Love it. 
Love to look at it. Yeah, that All right. Train scene alone. You know what? I think that's it. Uh, I don't want to keep Cody too much longer <laughs> from right. his lunch. Great questions out there. You guys got some live questions. Keep them coming. If we didn't get to them, New Year, right? Yeah. Next, next week's show is pre-taped. We've already got that all figured out, figured out. In January, we'll be back in full force. Send us your questions using uh, the hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Go to the Facebook group, ask to join. Uh, Chad and Lauren and everyone over there runs that, and you can get a question from there, too. I can't say thank you enough to all of you out there listening and John and Perry for coming into the studio today. Welcome back. Always good to have you here, John. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, and, yeah, keep sending your questions. And keep knocking on that door. I may just choose it. You never know. <laughs> Perry Nemiron. Thank you so much for having me. I always feel like super honored to be on this table. So yeah. thank you. You're good at what you do. Both of you there. A lot of fun. Thank you for listening to Jedi Council and watching in 2018. What a weird year to be a Star Wars fan. We had a lot of things, but I'll tell you this. I love Star Wars. We love Star Wars. We can roll up our sleeves. We can debate it. We can talk about it. We can wag fingers. We can have different interpretations, but we absolutely love Star Wars and no one, no one has ever told us to have that opinion. We love it from our hearts. We'll see you next time. Thanks to Cody and Adam who make us look beautiful all year round. We'll see you next year and next week on Collider Jedi Council. May the force be with you. You know, always. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.